Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So let's start with lecture 6, finance, valuation and leasing in real estate. So in this uh, lecture we will be talking about finance, valuation and leasing in real estate. So we will be talking about the financing uh, related terms of real estate. We will also be looking at valuation aspects of real estate that is how we value real estate properties. There are certain methods, we will be talking about that and then we will move on to the leasing that we have very briefly touched upon in earlier lecture where we talked about the, that leasing of uh, commercial spaces and re residential spaces and how they are different. So on that what are the different leasing uh, methods which are there that also we uh, be, be part of this particular session. So let us move on to the table of content for this particular session. So, in this particular session, we will be talking about real estate finance, we will be talking about sources of real estate financing, we will be talking about regulatory framework for this, we will be talking about loan structures, what are the loan structures which are available. Then uh, when we talk about financing, we always talk about risk management, so that will also be discussed in this session. And then uh, we will introduce the concept of leasing in real estate specifically. We will also talk about real estate valuation, different approaches to valuation. Specifically, we will talk about sales comparison approach, we will talk about income capitalization approach and cost approach of valuation. Uh, we will look at different types of lease agreements, what are the lease terms and conditions lease negotiation processes, lease documentation. So in this session, we will be covering all these important concepts relating to real estate finance, valuation and leasing. So first let us talk about what we discussed in last class and that was real estate economics. So in real estate economics, first we discussed some basics of economics, um, we understood the the business cycle, the different phases of business cycle, how the, the phase such as recession, uh, depression, recovery, prosperity, all these are impacting the uh, overall economy. And we also understood how the demand and supply is impacted by these different phases of economy. During these phases of economy, what are the different situations, what are the different conditions for business to operate. And when we talked about overall economy, we all then also switched on, switched to uh, the real estate economy, the impact of economy on real estate sector. So specifically to real estate market, what are the impacts of that, that were discussed in previous session. We understood that when the buyer's demand is high, then selling of residential units, leasing of commercial spaces becomes easy, it becomes a seller's market. But when it is vice versa, then it becomes difficult for companies to operate. And in, during depression stages of economy, where we have very, very difficult uh, phase of economy, the, uh, the companies are very finding it very difficult to operate very, because of the very, very low demand then in that case how the companies can survive. We understood all this in that particular session. We also understood how the government plays a crucial role in deciding the policies which can impact the overall economy and how they can safeguard certain industries, specifically to real estate, how interest rates and certain other important measures are taken by government and central banks which can impact the uh, viability of certain uh, parts of real estate and how they are impacting real estate market. So all that was part of that particular session. 
Now moving on, we understand that economy is important and crucial for real estate. But there is some other factors like financing of real estate that will be discussed in this particular session along with valuation and leasing. So let's start. So introduction to real estate finance. So first we will talk about definition of real estate finance. So real estate finance encompasses the financial activities and mechanisms involved in acquiring, developing and managing real estate assets. It involves the acquisition of funds, investment analysis, risk assessment and the deployment of capital for real estate projects and transactions. Importance of finance in property transaction. Access to capital. Real estate finance facilitate access to capital for acquiring, developing and investing in properties. It enables individuals, business and institutions to leverage financial resources to pursue real estate opportunities. Risk management. Finance play a crucial role in managing risk associated with, with the real estate investment. Thorough financial analysis and risk assessment. Investors can identify and mitigate risk such as market volatility, credit risk and regulatory changes. Then the situation of enhanced liquidity. Real estate finance enhance liquidity in the market by providing mechanism for buying, selling and financing properties. It enables investors to unlock the value of their real estate assets and deploy capital in new opportunities. Effective real estate finance strategies can optimize return on investment by maximizing cash flows, minimizing cost and mitigating financial risks. It allows investors to enhance profitability and achieve their financial objectives. Financial, fi finance facilitate property transactions by providing funding for acquisitions, construction projects and development initiatives. It enables buyers to purchase properties, developers to undertake projects and lenders to extend loans. In summary, real estate finance is integral to property transaction, driving access to capital, managing risk, enhancing liquidity, optimizing returns and facilitating transactions in real estate market. Understanding the principle and mechanisms of real estate finance is essential for navigating the complexities of the market and making informed investment decisions. Now uh, this is very well known, we have discussed it sometimes earlier also that real estate requires high capital. When we are talking about such high capital, whether it, it is for residential real estate, ownership of your own house, leasing of commercial spaces, opening shops in big shopping malls. It is a very high cost business, requires lot of money to do all that. So when we are talking about all that, we are talking about financing of such operations financing of such investment decisions and when we are talking about financing we have to understand that we have to have uh, a proper fund, uh, uh, understanding of how this will play what are the risk associated with it but we in general understand that financing for real estate is very important and that is why as a uh, student who wants to understand this particular area financing of real estate uh, understanding is important concepts to know. So moving on, we have sources of real estate financing. So understanding the diverse sources of real estate financing, available uh, availability is crucial for developers, investors and home buyers alike. So in this particular section, uh, we'll provide an overview of the various financing options and government initiatives which support real estate financing. So let's talk about bank loans. So bank loans are significant uh, and they are, they are providers of real estate finance offering various loan products such as home loans, construction loans and project finance. 
होम लोन्स आर कॉमनली अवेल्ड बाई इंडिविजुअल होम बायर्स फॉर परचेजिंग रेजिडेंशियल प्रॉपर्टीज वाइल प्रोजेक्ट फाइनेंस सपोर्ट रियल इस्टेट डेवलपर्स इन फंडिंग कंस्ट्रक्शन प्रोजेक्ट्स देन मूविंग ऑन टू नॉन बैंकिंग फाइनेंशियल कंपनीज एन बी एफ सीज एन बी एफ सीज प्ले अ वाइटल रोल इन रियल इस्टेट फाइनेंसिंग प्रोवाइडिंग लोन्स टू डेवलपर्स एंड होम बायर्स ऑफन विद मोर फ्लेक्सीबल टर्म्स कंपेयर टू ट्रेडिशनल बैंक्स देन एन बी एफ सी में स्पेशलाइज इन स्पेसिफिक सेगमेंट्स ऑफ द रियल इस्टेट मार्केट सच एज कमर्शियल रियल इस्टेट और अफोर्डेबल हाउसिंग केटरिंग टू डाइवर्स फाइनेंशियल नीड्स सो बेसिकली वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट एन बी एफ सीज रिलेटिंग टू रियल इस्टेट हेयर देर कैन बी एन बी एफ सीज विच आर ऑपरेटिंग इन अदर सेगमेंट्स बट वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट रियल इस्टेट रिलेटेड एन बी एफ सीज दैट 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 आर लाइक प्रोवाइडिंग लोन्स फॉर हाउसिंग लोन फॉर कमर्शियल रियल इस्टेट सो दैट इज द फोकस हेयर द एन बी एफ सीज विच आर लैंडिंग इन दिस पर्टिकुलर एरियाज देन वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट हाउसिंग फाइनेंस कंपनीज विच स्पेशलाइज इन प्रोवाइडिंग हाउसिंग फाइनेंस सोल्यूशन ऑफरिंग होम लोन्स दे ऑल्सो ऑफर कंस्ट्रक्शन फाइनेंस एंड अदर रियल इस्टेट रिलेटेड प्रोजेक्ट्स बट द फोकस एरिया इज हाउसिंग फाइनेंस सो दीज एंटिटीज आर रेगुलेटेड बाई नेशनल हाउसिंग बैंक एंड फोकस प्राइमरली ऑन फाइनेंसिंग रेजिडेंशियल प्रॉपर्टीज देन वी मूव ऑन टू प्राइवेट इक्विटी एंड वेंचर कैपिटल ना प्राइवेट इक्विटी फॉर्म्स एंड वेंचर कैपिटल फंड इन्वेस्ट इन रियल इस्टेट प्रोजेक्ट्स प्रोवाइडिंग इक्विटी फाइनेंसिंग और डेट टू डेवलपर्स पी वी सी फंडिंग इज ऑफन शॉर्ट फॉर लार्ज स्केल प्रोजेक्ट्स कमर्शियल डेवलपमेंट एंड हाई ग्रोथ अपॉर्चुनिटीज सो फर्स्ट वी डिस्कस्ड सर्टन आस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ फाइनेंसिंग रिलेटिंग टू बायर्स buyers of real estate buying of real estate for uh, residential real estate then uh, that is the home loan then we talked about nbfc which are lending for commercial spaces so if you are um, somebody who is interested in buying of a commercial space for opening a business but there are other um, areas which are um, also operating for financing towards the supply side now in the real estate we are talking about developers developers of real estate the uh, the builders the people who will be building real estate so how they are financing so the option of private equity and venture capital is available for them they provide loans and such such other uh, financial instruments uh, for the financing of the real estate supply side that is the developer the builders so that is there so th- that particular side then we also should talk about government initiative supporting real estate financing so we have pradhan mantri awas yojana we touched upon this earlier also that pmay is a government initiative aimed at promoting affordable housing then scheme offers credit linked subsidies and incentives for home buyers developers so and financial institution to boost affordable housing projects and increase home ownership so that particular area is there then there are certain acts which have recently been passed like rera so rera has brought transparency accountability and consumer protection in the real estate sector this act requires developer to register their project with regulatory authorities adhering to project timeline and maintain a separate escrow account for project funds enhancing investor confidence and facilitating real estate financing so there are certain provisions of rera which also indirectly impact uh, the financing of real estate so that is also there so the safeguarding of consumer by certain provisions by government so government uh, like we discussed earlier government is very much present uh, in the uh, overall uh, scheme of things in real estate uh, industry and uh, there are certain uh, um, um, the, the the initiatives the certain decisions of government which uh, can impact the real estate market so if somebody is understanding real estate market they should always understand this that the uh, awareness of government initiative programs government policies should be very well understood and they should be updated with all the information uh, relating to government schemes and uh, policies then another important facet which has just been added has been the infrastructure status which the government has granted uh, to affordable housing projects making them eligible for various benefit such as tax incentives access to institutional funding and priority central lending by banks 
So that is another important measure which has taken place. So by leveraging these diverse source of real estate financing and government initiatives, stakeholders in the Indian real estate market can access capital, mitigate risk and dive, drive sustainable growth and development in the sector. So this is something we have to understand and uh, act upon. Then we move on to the next one which is your regulatory framework. So understanding of the regulatory framework governing real estate finance is essential for navigating the complexity of this market. Now certain uh, key regulations comes from RBI. So what are the RBI guidelines? So let's see that. So the RBI plays a significant role in regulating and supervising the banking and financial sectors in India including the real estate financing. Then RBI guidelines cover various aspects of real estate lending including loan to value ratio, risk weight, provisioning norms and prudential norms for asset classification and in income recognition. Now these policies are impacting the, uh, the banks and the NBFCs. So the, the institutions which are lending for home loan, for um, um, the other property related loans are being governed by the policies made by RBI. So RBI is controlling them through what measures? So we are saying that RBI is controlling them through loan to value ratios, through risk weights, which the uh, institutions have to maintain. So they are in control. And because of these prudent measures, we may be able to save ourselves from difficult times. Like we have discussed earlier that 2008-2009 was a, a particular um, difficult phase of economy and uh, that GFC, a big part of that was because of what happened in the, uh, in the real estate sector in um, US. So, uh, uh, see, the, the, so the, uh, the central bank in our case, RBI, will try to regulate uh, the lending. And these are the measures. So, uh, loan to uh, value ratios, risk weight, provisioning norms, these are acting in that particular area. Then taxation policies and incentive relevant to real estate finance. So we have direct taxes. So in India, real estate transactions are subject to various direct taxes, including income tax, capital gain tax, and stamp duty. Then income tax is levied on rental income, profits from property sales, and other real estate income. So that is uh, there. Then capital gain tax, which applies to gains arising from sales of real estate assets, with different rates for short-term and long-term capital gain. Another thing which we have to keep in mind, then stamp duty, which is payable on property transactions, including sales deed, lease agreements and mortgage deeds, and varies across states. So that is there. And then we have indirect taxes. So goods and service tax is applicable to sale of under construction properties and commercial leases with different rates for residential and commercial properties. Then we also have certain provision like input tax credit on GST paid for construction material and services available for developers, potentially reducing overall project cost. So there are certain measures which are, uh, which are important to understand. Uh, right now we are talking about these concepts. They are uh, uh, concepts which, um, uh, which um, uh, are uh, very crucial for the, uh, the, uh, the stakeholders of real estate because they can impact the cost of doing business they may impact the, uh, the financing of the business uh, uh, and in case of uh, buyers, they will impact the uh, financing of their purchases. So uh, understanding of them. Then incentives and deductions. So government offers various incentives and deduction to promote real estate development and investment including deduction to interest on housing loan under section 24 of the Income Tax Act. So that is a very important provision which can impact the real estate in, uh, development. Then affordable housing projects, which may qualify for additional benefits such as tax holidays and concessional tax rates under schemes like PMAY uh, and affordable housing fund. So these are the different type of ways in which the policies of government uh, through direct taxes, indirect taxes, incentives and deduction is impacting the, the, the business of real estate in India specifically. Then we have loan structures. So, so uh, uh, there are different type of loan structures which are available in India. We will talk about uh, the, uh, these specific structures. Now, for, so first of, first of all, we will talk about fixed rate loans. 
So fixed rate loans offer a stable interest rate for entire loan term. Borrowers benefit from predictable monthly payment as the interest rate remains unchanged regardless of market fluctuation. These loans are suitable for borrowers seeking stability and certainty in their loan payment, especially in a rising interest rate environment. Then we have floating rate loans. So floating rate loan, also known as adjustable rate loan, have an interest rate that fluctuates periodically based on market condition. The interest rate is typically tied to a benchmark rate such as the repo rate or MCLR. These are uh, such certain uh, rates which are they are uh, impacting the, uh, uh, the decisions of central bank. So, uh, the, uh, uh, this is something which will impact the, uh, the business, uh, the, the, the banks and, uh, uh, and so they will have to uh, keep a watch on repo rate and MCLR which are released by RBI on a periodic uh, fashion and uh, they impact the, uh, the lending uh, of uh, uh, these banks and these NBFCs. Then we have borrowers may initially benefit from lower interest rate, but their payment can increase or decrease over time based on market uh, movements. Then we have hybrid loans. So hybrid loans combine features of both fixed and floating rate. So these loans typically have fixed interest rate for an initial period for let's say for example of 3 to 5 years and then they convert they may convert to floating rate for the remainder of the loan term then borrowers can benefit from the stability of fixed rate during initial initial period and then transitioning to floating rate potentially taking advantage of lower rates in the future so when uh, a buyer of a home will be going and uh, going to a bank or to a NB nbfc they will be deciding on what kind of loan structure they want to opt for whether they want to go for fixed rate, whether they want to go for floating rate, whether they want to go for hybrid rate, then they will have to take a decision. So financial advisor will be involved in that particular decision because uh, like I said earlier, the, whole, uh, the home loan, the, the loan for property, the, the loan for real estate is a very significant uh, amount. And when we are talking about such a significant amount, the decision has to be very well calculated because it is impacting so many um, things and it is uh, for a prolonged period of time. So this decision that what kind of rate loan, uh, what kind of structure we will be following for loan, we will have to see. Then uh, comparison of these loan structures, suitability. Now fixed rate loan suitable, it is ideal for borrowers seeking stable payment and protection against rising interest rate. Uh, advantages, predictable monthly payment protection against interest rate fluctuations. We can understand that we are safeguarding us from uh, predictable, we are safeguarding from the fluctuations of the interest rate. So one advantage is that we are not being impacted by the fluctuation of interest rate. We are basically uh, paying the same fixed rate. So uh, that is there. So the fix, fixed uh, uh, rate is one advantage we can say. Now uh, we may have higher initial interest rate compared to floating rate loan. So the financial institution, they will also think that whether they should, um, uh, uh, like when they are offering you such fixed interest rate, they will also uh, have their own profit to uh, uh, like take care of. So it may cost you more, but whether you want fluctuated rate or not, that is uh, your decision and you will have to take uh, in accordance with the financial advice of the right people. But Fixed rate loan is something which is providing us a fixed rate and we should understand that. Then floating rate loan, then the suitability of this. So suitable for borrowers, comfortable with interest rate fluctuations and seeking potential cost savings in a declining rate environment. So uh, some people may understand economy, they may understand, uh, they have a confidence that they will understand these fluctuating rate and they can very well manage it. So they may go for the fluctuating rate, they will opt for this. And this will be uh, uh, lower in cost uh, in comparison to um, uh, the fixed rate loan uh, in some situations. So they will try to maximize their benefit. And so if they are comfortable with it, they will go for floating rate. Then what are the advantages? So initial lower interest rates, potential for interest saving if the rate decreases. And then payment can increase with rising interest rate. 
leading to uncertainty. That is a risk which is there with the floating rate that it may rise with the higher rising interest rate. So, this has to be very well thought out and somebody who is prudent enough in understanding of the economy will be uh, going for this kind of rate. Then we have hybrid loans, then the suitable for borrowers looking for balance, stability and flexibility in their loan payment. What are the advantages? So, initial fixed rate period provides stability, potential for lower rate in the future. Now, what are the considerations we have to keep in mind here? So, payment may increase after the fixed rate period ends depending on market condition. So, something which have to be taken care by uh, the person who is uh, availing this loan and um, this is there. So, there are different ways in which the different structures of loan which are available uh, which can be utilized by the, um, the, uh, the borrower. Then um, moving on, we have uh, risk management in real estate finance. Now, we are, when we are talking about finance, we should always uh, understand that risk is definitely a part of any financial uh, instrument. So, we have to understand what are the different risks which are there. So, market risk, this particular refers to potential loss arising from adverse movements in real estate market conditions such as fluctuation in property prices, demand supply dynamics and economic conditions. Factors like changes in interest rate, GDP growth and geopolitical event can significantly impact property value and investment return. Then we have risks such as credit risk. Now, credit risk arise from potential default of borrowers or counterparties involved in real estate financing transactions. Lender face the risk of non-payment or delayed payment by borrowers leading to financial losses and liquidity challenges. Then we have regulatory risk. So, regulatory risk pertain to changes in government policies, regulations or legal framework affecting real estate financing. Then we have regulatory changes such as amendment to zoning laws, tax regulations or environmental regulation. So, basically both for central and state government regulation changes can take place and when we are talking about real estate, we should always remember, uh, we have discussed this that the both the policies of central government and state government and at some stages your municipal level local bodies are also impacting the real estate. So, all these policies are a regulatory risk, change in uh, policies can be a regulatory risk. So, strategies for mitigation of risk, so diversification of portfolio, so if we have to so, um, like understand this that diversification is one way out, so diversification of investments across different asset classes locations and types of property can help mitigate market risk. Investor can allocate capital to a mix of residential, commercial and industrial properties to spread risk exposure. Please understand this that we are talking about investor risk here, it is not about the ownership of property. So, ownership of property where we are talking about using it for residential purposes, then that is something which is a very one time affair for people because they are using it for housing need. So, government understand that. So, they have placed lot of safeguards for the people who are owning their houses for the first time maybe. So, the government has made lot of safeguards there, but we are talking about investment uh, in real estate here. So, uh, see it through that lens. So, the due diligence and credit assessment. So, conducting thorough due diligence and credit assessment of borrowers and counterparties can mitigate credit risk. So, when it comes to NBFC banks, how they are mitigating. So, the due diligence of the people whom they are lending to, their credit score. So, they will also have to be very prudent whom they are giving loan to. So, this due diligence has to be taken care by the NBFCs, the banks, so that is there. Then compliance with regulations, so uh, staying abreast of regulatory developments and ensuring compliance with applicable laws and regulation is crucial for mitigating regulatory risk. Real estate developers and investors should proactively monitor regulatory changes. They should be uh, aware of the, what the changes which are play, taking place in regulation. Then risk hedging instruments, they should uh, utilize risk hedging instruments such as derivative, insurance and interest rate uh, swaps that can help mitigate markets and interest rate risk. Hedging strategies can protect against adverse market movement and provide downside protection in volatile market conditions. So, there are different ways in which this can be managed in real estate and we have to 
we have to be aware of these measures. Then moving on to real estate valuation. So we have discussed about the financial aspect of the real estate and then and now we will move on to the valuation, how to uh, do the valuation of the real estate. So first we will understand the definition of this aspect and then we will go to the importance of valuation in real estate. So real estate valuation is the uh, process of determining the monetary worth of the property. It involves assessing various factors such as location, size, condition and market trends to arrive at an accurate estimate of the property value. So valuation is, a, is crucial for both buyers and sellers to make informed decisions. For buyers, valuation help ensure they pay a fair price for the property and avoid overpaying. For sellers, valuation ensures they set an appropriate asking price that attracts buyers while maximizing returns. Valuations also play a key role in securing financing as lender use property value assessments to determine loan amount and interest rate. Additionally, valuation provides valuable insight for investors looking to assess potential return and risk associated with the real estate investments. Understanding the importance of real estate valuation sets the stage for effective property transaction, guiding stakeholders towards favorable out outcome. And so, we will now understand the valuation of real estate. So, first, the approaches to valuation. So, we have sales comparison approach we have income capitalization approach, we have cost approach. So we have these different approaches which we can take for the valuation of real estate. Then we will explain each of them and its application in real estate valuation. So let's understand that. So, so first the overview of these valuation methods. So real estate valuation employs three main approaches. We have sales comparison, we have income capitalization and we have cost approach. So let's move on to the first one. So sales comparison approach. In this, we do estimate by property value, comparing it to similar recent sales, commonly used for residential properties with ample sale data. That is the particular sector which we can go for, for this sales comparison approach. What has happened recently in a particular area can help us in guiding what will be the value of a particular property in that particular area. So the, uh, the sales of existing, uh, the existing sales which have happened in that area can guide us regarding the valuation of other properties. Then we have income capitalization approach that is determining value based on income potential. So idea ideal for income producing properties like rental and commercial properties, commercial buildings. So how much they can, um, uh, how much income they can produce that is there. So based on, based on that, then we have cost approach. So estimating value by assessing replacement cost, right? So suitable for new or unique properties with limited sales data. So if we want to replace a particular value, particular property, then what will be the, um, uh, the replacement cost? So that will be guiding us in this particular aspect. Now, how we are applying them? So professionals utilizes these approaches in com combination to drive accurate property values and insight from these methods guide real estate transaction benefiting buyers, sellers, lenders and investors. So this is the basic uh, understanding. We will now build upon this understanding. So let us first take the sales comparison approach. So, so, so sales comparison approach. So in this particular um, approach, uh, we provide valuable insights into the value of property by comparing it to similar properties that have recently been sold. Uh, so the sales comparison approach estimates the value of a property by analyzing recent sales of comparable properties in the same or similar neighborhood. It assumes that the value of property can be determined by comparing it to similar uh, properties that have recently transacted in the market. Uh, so location, uh, one of the factors which has to be considered. The proximity and desirability of the property's location play a significant role in its value properties in prime location or desirable neighborhoods typically command higher prices. Then we come to size and features. So comparable properties should have similar characteristics in terms of size, layout, number of bedrooms and bathrooms, amenities and overall condition. Then age and condition. So the age and condition of the property including any renovation or upgrade are important factors in assessing its value relative to comparable properties. Sales data. So recent sales transactions 
are given more weight in the analysis as they provide a more accurate reflection of current market condition. So let's consider an example of applying the sales comparison approach to value in a residential property in Bangalore. So the appraiser identifies recent sale of similar home in the same neighborhood and adjusts the sale price based on different differences in size, features and conditions to estimate the subject property's value. Similarly, when valuing a commercial property in Chennai, the appraiser analyzes recent sale of comparable office building or retail spaces in the vicinity and make adjustments for difference in the location, size and other relevant factors to determine the property's value. So by utilizing the sales comparison approach, real estate professionals can derive accurate estimate of property value based on the principles of substitution, providing valuable insights for buyers, sellers, lenders and investors in the real estate market. So this is one of the approach. Then we also have a approach of income capitalization. Now this is another approach of valuation. Now what is this? So uh, this approach provides valuable insight by um, looking at the value of income producing properties by analyzing their potential income streams. Now in this approach the property value is calculated by capitalizing its expected income streams into a present value. This involves dividing the property's net operating income by capitalized rate, cap rate to determine its value. So uh, a little finance here but basically the idea is that the, uh, the valuer is trying to understand the value of uh, a particular property by understanding that how much income it can generate. So let's consider uh, rent. So the rental income generated by the property that will play a crucial role in this approach. This include both current and projected rental income. Then expenses. So operating expenses such as property taxes, insurance, maintenance and management fees are subtracted from the rental income to calculate the property's net operating income. That is at what uh, net money will be re required for operation of this particular venture. So the uh, and then the capital rate, uh, the capitalization rate the, uh, reflects the investor required rate of return and risk associated with the investment. It is determined based on the market condition, property type, location and other factors. So uh, at what uh, rate the loan will be available. So that will be there. So th that has to be uh, also taken care of. So when we are saying that a particular venture will produce this much amount of money and whether we should um, like uh, so if a particular commercial property because we are talking about commercial properties here and if we invest in that uh, uh, if we are considering that this will be the income then what should be the value of that property. So that is the basic aspect. So in properties uh, which are uh, where we are trying to produce income out of them this capitalization approach will be uh, better utilized. Then we also have cost approach. So the cost approach um, is um, basically a fundamental method where we talking about the uh, cost of replacing or redu uh, reproducing uh, a property with similar property. So this approach assumes that a buyer would not pay more for a property than it would cost to acquire uh, an equivalent substitute property. So if you can easily um, buy uh, existing property then why will you in, uh, try to pay more for a uh, uh, property if there is existing property already there. So the replacement cost, we are looking at the replacement aspect in this particular method. So in the cost approach, the property value is determining by calculating the cost of constructing a similar property from scratch, accounting for depreciation and obsolescence. The appraiser estimate the current cost of the construction and adjust it for factors such as physical deterioration, functional obsolescence and economic obsolescence. So these will be the factors which have to be looked into the property value. So factors which will be considered in cost estimation. So depreciation account for the reduction of the property uh, due to wear and tear, physical deterioration or outdated features. Functional obsolescence refers to deficiency in the property design whether it is functional or not now these days. Economic uh, obsolescence. So changes in market conditions, zoning, some certain um, uh, buildings in situated in certain areas where there are no access available because of some uh, project which have come up and the, uh, the, the access to that is not there and maybe the business aspect of that has diminished. So all this will be taken care in the cost approach where we are talking about the replacement of that property. So we have basically three approaches, 
one where we are comparing the existing sales which have taken place in that particular area then second where we are looking at the income potential of the business uh, th uh, through that particular property and then the third one is a cost approach where we are talking about replacement that is if we make a new building from the scratch then what will be the cost and whether we can replace uh, the existing building with that so these aspects are the uh, aspects which can be used for the valuation of real estate then moving on to the leasing in real estate part so first we will understand the uh, the definition uh, of uh, leasing so uh, so leasing in the context of real estate refers to contractual agreement wherein a property uh, owner grants the right to the use and occupy their property to another property tenant in exchange for monetary considerations so uh, that is there and uh, then what is the importance of leasing so leasing plays a pivotal role in facilitating the utilization and mo uh, monetization of real estate assets um, enabling property owner to derive income from their investment for tenant leasing provides access to desired spaces without the need for large capital outlays associated with property ownership so you are not outrightly buying a property you are going into a lease for maybe a prolonged period of time so um, generally we see that the lease arrangements are very much there in the commercial properties because the lease in the commercial properties are for a very prolonged period of time so maybe like 4 4 5 7 3 depending on the kind of business we are talking about whether we are talking about office building whether we are talking about um, uh, shopper uh, the shopping um, uh, malls so the lease uh, in those different different types of uh, um, uh, buildings will be different but we can understand that generally they will be for a good uh, uh, number of years and this is there so but it is not outright buying of the property it is leasing them for the long period of time so that is the advantage which we are getting there then moving on to the types so types of lease agreements so we have gross lease in gross lease the tenant pays a fixed rent amount and the landlord bears all operating expenses including property taxes insurance and maintenance cost this type of lease is commonly found in residential leasing arrangement where tenants prefer a predictable rent amount without the hassle of additional expenses then we have net lease so unlike a gross lease in a net lease the tenant is responsible for paying a base rent amount plus a portion of all the operating expenses associated with the property such as property tax insurance and maintenance net leases are prevalent in commercial leasing especially for single tenant properties where tenants assume a higher level of responsibility for property related expenses then we also have a triple net lease a triple net lease uh, is a sub type of net lease where the tenant bears all operating expenses including property taxes insurance maintenance and utilities in addition to the base rent so this lease structure is commonly used for commercial properties lease to corporate tenants offering landlords a hand off approach to property management so depending on different situations which is suitable for tenant or um, the owner of the building there can be different arrangements so gross lease uh, to uh, triple net lease we can see that the liability on the owner is decreasing and uh, uh, liability towards the tenant is increasing so tenant is uh, uh, saying that we will uh, pay for all the expenses also so we are moving towards from gross to net the tenant is taking more and more responsibility so that is there then we are talking about the lease terms and conditions so we have uh, lease duration so the lease duration also known as the lease term specifies the period for which the lease agreement is valid so uh, uh, we have uh, various uh, uh, like periods we have just discussed according to the type of um, real estate we are talking about whether it is residential commercial and commercial whether it is office whether it is uh, shopping center whether it is industrial so the period will be different but period is that which is the um, uh, the total period for which the lease contract the contract is there between the owner and the tenant so residential leases often have shorter duration and while commercial leases may extend to long periods of time 
uh, for example, uh, 5, 10 or 15 years, depending on what kind of uh, commercial space you are talking about. Then we are talking about uh, rent amount and payment schedule. So the rent amount denotes the monetary consideration payable by the tenant to the landlord. So what is the rent being paid? So that is there uh, in exchange for the rights to occupy the lease premise. The payment schedule is there which outlines the frequency and mode of rent payment, whether monthly, quarterly or annually, how the rent will, the rent, uh, the rent will be paid. So what is the process for that? So that also has to be clearly defined. Then maintenance responsibility. So the rent amount denotes the monetary consideration payable by the tenant to the landlord in exchange for the rights to occupy the leased premises. Then the payment schedule outline the frequency and mode of rent payment. Right. So, we have these um, uh, rent payments. Then we have maintenance responsibility. So, maintenance responsibility delineate the obligation of the landlord and tenant, tenant concerning property upkeep. So, repair, maintenance and uh, uh, who will be at the responsibility. So, that will be there in the maintenance and res uh, maintenance responsibility. Then utility and operational expenses. So, what are they? So, lease agreement may specify the allocation of utility expenses such as electricity, water, gas between the landlord and the tenant. Then uh, uh, property taxes, common area maintenance charges, insurance premium may also be appointed and uh, decided that who will be the uh, party will, who will be responsible for uh, utility and operating expenses. So, whether it will be the tenant, whether it will be the owner. So, all this will be cleared in the lease terms and conditions. So, lease uh, the contract the, uh, which will be signed uh, for this lease uh, agreement which, which will be there, the uh, both the parties tenant and uh, owner will decide that who will be responsible for what. So, clearly spelt out uh, um, um, uh, um, contract will be there. And then the security deposit, the security deposit serve as financial security for landlord against potential damages, unpaid rent or breaches for the lease agreement, uh, breaches of the lease by the tenant. So, um, there should be uh, and in India we specifically, we also have the security deposit which is equivalent to certain number of months rent which is refundable at the end of the lease terms subject to compliance with lease terms and conditions. So, certain amount of uh, safeguard in terms of security deposit. Then the termination and renewal. So, lease agreement outline provisions for lease termination. So, you cannot just come out of the lease that uh, our purpose is uh, fulfilled and now we want to uh, end our lease and we want to give it to somebody else. That may be the case or I want to uh, uh, take my uh, office somewhere, somewhere else and now I want to uh, abruptly uh, end my agreement with you. So, that cannot be there. So, there has to be a process for that. So, that process will be your termination and renewal. So, lease agreement outlines the provisions for lease termination including notice period, condition for early termination and consequences of the breach. So, incorporating these key lease terms and conditions into le lease agreement will uh, safeguard both the owner, the landlord and the uh, tenants. So, that is there. Then we are talking about lease negotiation process. Now, this is important that there will be certain stages of lease negotiation. There will be some initial discussion, then there will be some mature discussion. So, there will be multiple layers of discussion and finally, the lease will be finalized. So, what are these steps? So, first is your initial discussion. So, the negotiation process typically begins with an initial discussion between the landlord and the prospective tenant during which both parties express their requirements, preferences and concerns regarding the lease terms and condition then offer and counter offer following the in, in, in initial discussion, formal offer and counter offer are exchange between the parties. This stage involves negotiation on key terms such as rent amount, lease duration, maintenance responsibility and many additional provisions. Then we have agreement finalization. So, once the parties reach consensus on the terms of the lease, the agreement is finalized. This entails drafting the lease document, incorporating the negotiation terms reviewing it thoroughly and obtaining signatures from both the parties. Then uh, strategies for effective lease negotiation. 
understanding market dynamics. So, before a, a entering negotiation, it is essential for both landlord and tenant to research market trends, rental rates and prevailing lease terms in the specific locality or property type. This understanding provides valuable leverage during negotiations. Then we have clarify objectives and priorities. Clearly defining objectives and priorities helps streamline negotiations and focus on critical issues. Landlords should determine their desired rental income and uh, lease terms. Then maintain flexibility. That is another important, important strategy. Flexibility is key to successful negotiation. Both parties should be open to compromise and explore creative solutions to address each other's need. Then seek professional advice. Engaging legal and real estate prof uh, professionalism can provide valuable guidance and support through the negotiation process. So, these are the important things which we need to take care of. Then we come to lease documentation. So, lease agreement is there. We have seen that the lease agreement is the cornerstone of the, the lead uh, transaction. It outlines the terms and condition governing the lease relationship between the landlord tenant. Then we have rent receipt. So, a rent receipt serves evidence for rent payment uh, by the tenant to the landlord. It typically includes details such as rental period, amount paid, date of payment, property addresses. Then rent receipt essential for bon both landlord and tenant to maintain accurate record of rental transaction and fulfill their financial obligation. And then we have uh, in, uh, these security deposit agreement. So, in security deposit agreement, we are talking about uh, formalizing the agreement between the landlord and tenant uh, uh, regarding the security deposit amount and its handling. Then uh, it specifies the purpose of the security deposit, condition for its refund or utilization and any deduction permitted by the landlord for damages or unpaid rent. Proper documentation of the security de uh, deposit agreement help prevent disputes between landlords and tenants at the end of lease terms regarding the return of the security deposit that is there. And then importance of proper documentation. So, proper documentation is essential for is essential uh, uh, to protect the interest of both parties and uh, ensure compliance with the legal requirement. Clear and comprehensive lease documentation minimize the risk uh, of misunderstanding, disputes and litigation during the lease terms. Adherence to legal requirements and standard practices in lease documentation enhance the credibility and enforceability of lease agreement providing uh, peace of mind to landlords and tenant alike. So, concluding this lease documentation serve as a critical framework for establishing and maintaining landlord tenant relationship and uh, so basically we are saying that proper recording uh, of uh, rent receipts security deposits. Uh, this is crucial for both the safeguard of owners and of the tenants and the lease agreement which we have dealt, uh, we, we, we have discussed in detail uh, all the different uh, aspects of uh, legal, uh, this lease agreement are essential very well. They should be understood by both the parties, uh, thoroughly discussed and they should be then um, formalized. So, this is very, very important that all these aspects are taken care of and proper recording and proper um, paperwork is kept both by both the parties so that in case of any future um, uh, discrepancies or uh, there are some certain uh, aspects which, which are contentious, then in that case they can discuss them and decide that this was uh, were there in that document. So, the proper uh, documentation. And then uh, summarizing what we have done today. So, uh, we covered from real estate finance to v valuation to leasing and uh, we talked about what are the different aspects of real estate financing, how they are impacting the purchasing of real estate, uh, what uh, are the different types of loans which are available, then we looked at different valuation methods, what are the different um, valuation methods which are there and then we also looked at uh, the lease, how the lease are different for resident residential properties for commercial properties and how uh, the lease uh, document uh, has what are the different terms which are there, what are the different aspects which we have to take care in the lease agreement. So, all this was part of this particular session. So, thank you.